Good afternoon or good morning for the for those who are in the US. I would like to welcome all our lawyer participants to the third, the third series of webinars organized by the Deccan Heritage Foundation, His Highness Sri Kandadatta Narasimharaja Wadia Foundation in Mysore and the Center for Islamic Studies at the University of Cambridge, UK. The first, lecture, the first lecture of these third webinars considered the female protagonists in the history of the Deccan. The second lecture, the contacts of the Dutch with the Ikiri successors of the Vijayanaga. Fascinating was the, the, the interpretation of the Dutch regarding the political networks during the turbulent political events of this post-Vijayanaga period, which did not always agree with the epi epigraphical evidence of the time. This third lecture deals with the important role of the Jains as patrons of the arts and their role during the Hoysala period. And the lecturer is Catherine um, Kaufdorf, uh, as, who has been working on the Jains for quite a long time, and who is Associate Curator of Arts um, of Asia and the Islamic World at the Detroit Institute of Fine Arts. She received her PhD in South Asian art history from Columbia University in 2013, completing a dissertation on temples of the Hoysala capital in Halebid, Karnataka. At the uh, Detroit Institute of Arts, the collab she collaborated with colleagues on the reinstallation of the Asian collection, opening new galleries in November 2018. Prior to joining the DIA in 2017, she held a Villa Mellon postdoctoral curatorial fellowship at the Walters Art Museum, Baltimore. She has published articles on architectural reuse in Hindu and Islamic contexts in the Deccan and on works of Tibetan art at the Walters Art Museum. Current projects include research related to DIA South Indian Yogini sculpture and publications on Hoysala period temples. Um, Dear Catherine, the stage is yours. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Helen, for that warm welcome. And hello, everyone. I will start sharing my screen and go into presenter mode. Does that look okay to everyone? Yes, perfect. Yeah. Okay, great. So I will just begin. So over the past few seasons, I've really enjoyed attending many lectures in this series. And I'd like to offer uh, my thanks to all the sponsors for bringing us all together in this exchange of ideas about the history and art history of the Deccan. I'd also like to thank Vivek and Helen for inviting me to participate as a speaker and to present some of my research on Hoysala period temples. And as Helen mentioned, um, my PhD dissertation focused on temples of the Hoysala capital, Dora Sumudra, now the town of Halibidu in southern Karnataka, and I've continued to return to the site and its very rich material since completing my graduate studies. Today, hmm, it's not advancing properly. Today, I will be speaking about Dora Samudra's Jain temples, which have not received as much scholarly attention as their Shaiva counterparts, but which were also prominent within the city's urban, religious, and political landscapes during the 12th and 13th centuries, when the Hoysala dynasty was at the height of its power. Three of these temples survive today, dedicated to the jinnas Parshvanatha, Adinatha, and Shantinatha, but inscriptions and other archaeological evidence point to the presence of many more. While I'll touch on several temples in my talk today, we'll look especially closely at the Parshvanatha Basadi, the largest of Dora Samudra's surviving Jain temples. And just a quick note, the word Basadi or Basti is commonly used in Karnataka to refer to a Jain temple, and Basadi also appears in Hoysala period inscriptions. Um, another word that refers to a Jain temple, which also appears in inscriptions, is Jinalaya, which means home or abode of the Jinna. And um, I'll be using these three words, temple, Basadi, and Jinalaya, interchangeably. So we know from an inscription published and translated in the series Epigraphia Karnataka that the Parshvanatha Basadi was built through the patronage of a courtier named Bopadeva and dedicated in 1133 CE. As I hope to show, 
This temple, its colossal devotional image, and its monumental foundation inscription attest to the role that Jain temples played in creating prestige for the Hoysala capital, both through their visual power and through the influential networks of religious and political leaders to which they were connected. But before delving into the rich material of the Parshvanatha temple, I want to take a step back and consider its place within the broader layout of the Hoysala capital. When Bhopadeva commemorated his temple's foundation in 1133, Dora Samudra was a city on the rise. The previous decade had seen the dedication of the Hoysaleshvara temple, a monumental double temple to Shiva built in a new radically sculptural style that has come to be identified with the Hoysala dynasty itself. Today, the Hoysaleshvara is the most famous temple of Halibidu, and for many people, the town's name is even synonymous with this building. The Hoysaleshvara and its sculpture-covered walls certainly would have made an impact on Dora Samudra when the temple was built in the years around 1120 CE, and even as the city grew, it remained one of the most prominent buildings of the capital. It certainly wasn't the only temple around, however. During these years, in the early to mid-12th century, merchants, royalty, and members of the court were actively supporting the foundation of new temples in the city, and presumably contributing to other urban developments for which records have not survived, such as marketplaces and domestic structures. Even though many of the buildings that once stood in the Hoysala capital no longer exist, surviving temples and temple ruins, traces of the city's fort wall, and fragmentary foundations that have been identified with the Hoysala Palace provide some idea of the city's layout. Also important are the water reservoirs that surround the city. And in fact, the earliest surviving Hoysala period inscription from Dora Samudra, which dates to 1062 or three, records construction related to these reservoirs. The remnants of the fort wall encircle an irregularly shaped area that spans just over two kilometers at its widest points. Much of this area is agricultural today, but during the city's time as a royal capital between the mid 11th and mid 14th centuries, we can imagine that many of today's fields would have been populated with the city's residents. While buildings made of perishable materials must once have stood throughout Dora Samudra, the concentration of stone temples and ruins in the eastern part of the fortified area suggests that this was a particularly active zone. The southeastern quadrant, where the palace and the largest temples were located, seems to have been the most prominent of all. And this is where the majority of the city's Jain temples were located. In addition to the three surviving temples of, in the compound of the Parshvanatha Basidi, another cluster of Jain temples seems to have been located approximately 100 meters to the south, and that's marked Temple Mounds on the map you see on the screen here. Recently, the ASI has begun excavating this area, and they've uncovered the foundations of a temple, as well as other architectural and sculptural materials. And I haven't yet had the opportunity to study these new finds in detail, uh, but they're sure to reveal exciting new information about Dora Samudra's Jain temples. Now, within the eastern zone of the city, a significant number of temples and ruins are situated along a particular north-south axis. Uh, and it angles a bit toward the west and the northern part of the city. I've marked it in yellow on the map there. It's likely that this axis marks the location of a major road, which during the Hoysala period was lined with many of the city's most prominent buildings. And today, a modern road runs along this very route. In addition to being a focus of urban growth, this thoroughfare must have been at the center of urban life in the Hoysala capital, a site of social and commercial interaction, as well as a route traveled by both residents and visitors wishing to get from point A to point B. The Parshvanatha temple occupied a prime location near the intersection of this road and another one that ran eastward from the palace. A modern street also now overlays this route, uh, but as with the north-south thoroughfare, surviving 12th and 13th century structures point to the presence of a road there during the Hoysala period too. In fact, all three surviving Jain temples of Dora Samudra are located along this east-west road, 
standing to itself, they face north toward the street that provided access to them. The walls of the compound they share are mostly a modern reconstruction, but the space these walls delineate seems to have been conceived as its own unit during the Hoysala period too. The entire compound is elevated and evenly cut stone blocks likely dating to the Hoysala period are found in some parts of this wall. The entrance gateway that gives access to the compound has also been altered since the 12th to 13th century. It may even be a completely later construction incorporating reused Hoysala period pillars into its facades. And it certainly has had some modern restoration work. Its superstructure made of brick and plaster probably dates to the 16th or 17th century. I mean, even if this gateway dates to a later period, it's possible that a Hoysala period gateway also once stood in the same place directly aligned with the Parshvanatha Basidi, it signals that temple's primacy within the compound. Now I've already mentioned that the Parshvanatha temple is the largest of the three temples. It's also the most finely finished and it was the first to be built. The much smaller temple to its east was constructed just a few years later in 1138 through the patronage of a local official, a Hegede named Malimaya. The inscription that provides this information also tells us that Malimaya came from a merchant family and that the temple also received donations from a collective group of merchants and artisans of the mint. This temple now enshrines a later image of Adinatha, but it was originally dedicated to the Jinna Malinatha. The name that was chosen for this temple, Nakara Jinalaya, underscores its association with the merchant community, a division of which was known as the Nakarats. More than a hundred years later, the Jain Nakaras of Dora Samudra were also involved in the foundation of the Shantinatha Basidi in 1256, as recorded by an inscription on the pedestal of that temple's monumental devotional image. And I'll return to this temple and its monumental jinnah uh, later on. Both seem to have been inspired by the example of the nearby Parshvanatha temple. So let's take a closer look at the Parshvanatha temple and its inscription. I've already mentioned that its patron was a courtier named Bopadeva and that the temple was consecrated in 1133 CE. The inscription that provides this information is an impressive monument in its own right. Standing nearly three meters tall and 1.2 meters wide, its text is carved in beautifully formed Kannada letters and the stele is topped with a finely carved jinnah and other figures. The scene is framed by the sun and moon, reminding us of the eternal authority of the text carved below, which will last as long as the sun and moon endure, as Hoysala inscriptions like to say. According to the text, Bopadeva had the temple built in honor of his recently deceased father, Gangaraja, one of the most celebrated military generals in Hoysala history. The inscription contains a wealth of information, but one of the passages I find most interesting is its declaration that Bopadeva had the temple built, quote, in the middle of the greatest of capital cities, Dora Samudra, end quote. Bopadeva was proud to construct this temple in the capital of the Hoysalas, and he wanted the inscription to underscore its central place within the city. Although not situated in the geographical midpoint of Dora Samudra, the temple did indeed occupy a central location. Remember, it stood right near the intersection of two prominent roads, one of which connected directly to the palace. Bopadeva's political standing and that of his late father must have helped him gain access to such a desirable plot of land for his new Janalaya. After the temple was built, it would have been seen by anyone traveling the roads that ran alongside it. It may even have been the first structure encountered by someone departing from the palace along that east-west road. Most likely, it would have been the first large-scale building in their path. So what did people see when they encountered the temple? Well, the building's exterior is elegant, with slender pilasters bridging, uh, bringing visual variation to the smooth surfaces of its walls and punctuating transitions between staggered Bhadra projections. Sculptural details, including makaras, jinnas, yakshis and yakshas, and other figures, embellish both its roofline and its ajishtana, or base. 
Today, the roof line is fairly flat with shallow projections corresponding to dome ceilings inside, but when the temple was built, it might have had a tower built of brick and plaster. The open pillared hall that precedes the temple is filled with bulbous curving Shrikara pillars that create visually engaging contours and also visible from a distance. Even in all its elegance and visual variation, the building's exterior is far more subdued than that of the Hoysaleshvara and other temples that we think of as Hoysala style today. In contrast to the dynamic sculpture covering nearly every surface of those temples' walls, the exteriors of most surviving Jain temples of the Hoysala period are relatively unadorned. The one exception is the Shantishvara Basidi at Jinanathapura, built by the general Rechana around the turn of the 13th century. Perhaps the restraint that we see in most Jain temple exteriors of the Hoysala period has to do with Jain ideals that encourage a renunciation of worldly attachments. I'm not so sure the explanation is quite this simple, however. Besides the counterexample of Jina Nathapura's Shantishvara Vasudhi, inscriptions attest to the worldly interests of Jain temple patrons like Bopadeva. As part of the laity, these patrons were not expected to renounce all attachments and enjoyments in pursuit of spiritual liberation as Jain monks and nuns were. If we turn back to the foundation inscription of Dora Samudra's Parshanatha Temple, there's no indication that Bopadeva and his contemporaries viewed the building's appearance as subdued. In fact, the text suggests quite the opposite. In the very same sentence that boasts of the temple's construction in the middle of Dora Samudra, the inscription lauds the artistic beauty of the new Jinalaya, declaring that even the god Brahma could not surpass the artistry of its carvings, proclaiming that the temple shone like the silver mountain, the famed Kailasa, and calling it Jagat Dilaka, ornament of the earth. During the Hoysala period then, people surely appreciated the elegantly designed and finely executed exterior of the Parshvanatha Basidi, but the building's interior, interior truly set it apart. Its richly carved pillars, ceilings, and shrines display a level of detail seen in the most lavishly sculptural temples of the Hoysala period, and the colossal uh, the colossal image of the Jinnah Parshvanatha enshrined within the temple sanctum inspires a sense of awe in the beholder. Towering over any human visitor, the size alone, some 4.5 meters in height, makes this Parshvanatha impressive, but it's also a beautiful sculpture. Standing in the meditative posture known as Kayot Sarga, or abandoning the body, the figure's softly modeled limbs and torso embody a yogic ideal, and his serene smile conveys a sense of calm reassurance. In keeping with Digumbara iconographical convention, his body is completely unadorned, free of all worldly attachments. And just a quick note of explanation here, the word Digumbara refers to one of two main sectarian traditions of the Jain religion. It translates to sky clad in reference to Digumbara monk's renunciation of all material belongings, including clothing. The other sectarian tradition is Shvetambara, a word that means white clad. And Shvetambara monks and nuns wear white robes but renounce most other material belongings. So in Shvetambara temples, jinnas are represented as wearing thin robes, but in contrast, Digumbara jinnas are represented nude. Surviving Jain temples and Jain inscriptions from the Hoysala period all have a Digumbara affiliation. As an embodiment of Digumbra ideals then, this Parshvanatha is nude, a model of uncompromising aestheticism. His Prabhavali, or backdrop, however, displays a level of sumptuous detail for which Hoysala sculptors are known. The intricacy of his festooned parasol and the inhabited vine that surrounds him visually contrast with the smooth austerity of Parshvanatha's body. The seven-headed serpent that shelters the jinnah is finished in exquisite detail. Its seven faces are delightfully expressive, with split tongues protruding between fangs. Even the back of the serpent is finished with a crosshatch pattern to indicate scales. In Parshvanatha's life story, the serpent king, Naranendra, protected the jinnah from an attack while he was meditating. 
Dharanindra is also represented in a more anthropomorphic form, standing to the jinnah's right, with three cobra heads above his crown. In this form, he is Parshvanatha's yaksha, the god who protects the jinnah's teachings. Each jinnah is associated with a male yaksha and a female yakshi, and Parshvanatha's yakshi, Padmavati, stands to his left, with a single serpent head above her crown. As deities who are attached to the world, yakshas and yakshis are represented with the adornments of royalty, as Hindu deities also are, and hoysala sculptors relished in the details of their crowns, jewelry, and clothing. We also see intricate details of the hoysala sculptor's chisel in the pillars and ceilings of the temple's Ranga Mandapa, the hall that precedes the sanctum. The central ceiling is especially remarkable. Constructed as a series of nested octagons and squares, every inch of its multi-layered surface is covered in sculpture. At its center, we see the Yaksha Dharanendra again, surrounded by celestial beings and kneeling devotees. The panels and beams that frame this central panel feature figures on parade, musicians, enthroned jinnas, auspicious kirtimukas, flowers, and a profusion of other imagery. The walls of the Ranga Mandapa are lined with eight shrines, each one featuring a tower with a seated jinnah at top. The devotional images they once enshrined are no longer there, but pitas or pedestals that remain within most of the shrines so that each one would have contained three sculptures. These pitas feature symbols known as lanchanas that are associated with individual jinnas. For example, the buffalo, which you see in the leftmost detail, is associated with Vasupuja, the 12th jinnah. The water pot is the sign of Malinata, the 19th jinnah, and the boar is the sign of Vimalanata, the 13th jinnah. Between the eight shrines then, all 24 jinnas would have been housed within the Parshvanatha temple's Rangamandapa. And indeed, the foundation inscription refers explicitly to the presence of all 24 jinnas in this temple. It tells us that the king himself, Vishnu Vardhana, granted income from the village of Javagalu to provide for the worship of the 24 jinnas here. This grant was also intended to provide food for ascetics and funds for repairs to the Basadi. Now, Vishnu Vardhana's grant to the Parshvanatha temple says a lot. On the one hand, it speaks to the status of Bopadeva and his family at the Hoysala court. Remember, Bopadeva's father, Gangaraja, in whose memory the temple was dedicated, was a high-standing general in the Hoysala army. He fought alongside Vishnu Vardhana in some of the most significant battles of his reign, including the Hoysala's victory against the Cholas at Talakadu in 1116 CE. The grant from Vishnu Vardhana to this temple also demonstrates the king's interest in supporting temples of all faiths within his kingdom. Among his activities in temple patronage, Vishnu Vardhana is perhaps best known for establishing the Jaina Keshava temple in Belur, dedicated to Vishnu, and indeed the king's name is quite Vaishnava. In addition to his Vaishnava patronage, however, he also supported Shaiva temples throughout his kingdom, as well as many Jain temples. Vishnu Vardhana's grant to the Parshvanatha Basidi in Dora Samudra might also speak to a desire to invest in the temples of his capital city. He had similarly supported the Shaiva Hoysaleshvara temple with grants when the merchant Ketamala founded that temple in 1120. But the Parshvanatha Basidi's foundation inscription tells us of an even more personal connection the king is said to have felt for this particular temple. Now, when the temple was established in 1133, Vishnu Vardhana had occupied the Hoysala throne for about 25 years. His reign is remembered as a high point in Hoysala history, involving a significant expansion of Hoysala power and territorial claims. We learned from the foundation inscription that at the time of Parshvanatha's consecration in Doris Mudra, the king was on a military campaign in the northern borderlands of the kingdom. We are told that priests took the remaining offerings from the consecration ceremony and brought them to Vishnu Vardhana at Bankapura, more than 200 kilometers to the northwest. At that moment, two important events had just taken place. Vishnu Vardhana had just defeated the Kadamba general Masana, 
thereby gaining new territory, and a new prince, the future Narasimha I, the future king Narasimha I, had just been born. When Vishnuvardhana received the priests and offerings from the new Jain temple of Dora Samudra, he attributed his fortunes in both conquest and progeny to the establishment and consecration of Parshvadeva, as the inscription calls this jinnah. Filled with great joy, the king bestowed new names upon both the jinnah and the prince. From that point forward, the newly consecrated Jinna and Dora Samudra would be called Sri Vijaya Parshvadeva, the illustrious Lord Parshva of Victory, and the future king would be named Sri Vijaya Narasimha Deva. Thus establishing a link between the auspicious events of Parshvanatha's consecration, Narasimha's birth, and his own military victory and territorial expansion, Vishnu Vardhana made his grant in support of the temple for the prosperity of the newborn prince and for universal peace. Now, the statement that the king made his grant for universal peace might seem to be at odds with the direct connection that has just been made between his recent military victory and the consecration of Parshvanatha. On the one hand, the text affirms the king's military activities, but on the other, it seems to attempt to represent him as having a commitment to the principle of nonviolence that is central to Jain ethics. In, many, in its many lines in praise of Vishnuvardhana, the inscription downplays the violence of his military career, even as it enumerates his victories. In contrast to other inscriptions celebration of gory battlefield activities, this text claims that one enemy after another submitted to Vishnuvardhana even before he resorted to violence. The inscription employs a similar strategy in its panegyrics of earlier Hoysala kings, claiming that they effortlessly subdued their enemies through mere threats, eschewing the violence that in reality led to their victories. The inscription also downplays the military career of Bhopadeva's father, Gangaraja, Rather than, <clears throat> excuse me, rather than telling us about his victories over the Cholas and other enemies, as many other Hoysala inscriptions do, the text emphasizes his commitment to the ideals of Jain laity. For instance, Gangaraja is celebrated for his knowledge of Jain teachings, for being an abode of the three jewels of the Jain faith, that is, right belief, right knowledge, and right conduct, and for his generosity in building and restoring Jain temples and making gifts to them. The name that Bopa David chose for the temple, however, has somewhat violent undertones. He called it the Droha Gharata Jinalaya, after one of Gangaraja's most widely used epithets, Droha Gharata. Translating to something like crusher of malice, this name has the potential to conjure imagery of physical violence in the reader's mind. However, it can also take on a metaphorical meaning that better aligns with Jain values suggesting the quelling of malicious intent in oneself perhaps as much as in others. For that matter, the name that the king chose for the Jinnah, Vijaya Parshvadeva, can also be interpreted metaphorically, with Vijaya pertaining not only to the Hoysala's military victory, but also to the spiritual victory over karma, emotions, and other attachments, which Jain teachings prioritize as a means to enlightenment and liberation. The word jinnah, after all, employs the same metaphor. Translating to victor or conqueror, a jinnah is one who has conquered all attachments, who teaches the path to the spiritual victory, and who is released from the cycle of rebirth that binds most of us to the world. Amidst this play between metaphor and reality, and between the violent careers and pious actions of the lay people involved in the foundation of the Parshvanatha Basidi, the inscription also provides information about the institutional leadership of the temple and invokes the names of respected Jain monks with whom Bhopadeva studied. One of these monks was Shubhad Chandra Siddhanta Deva, who is called Bhopa's guru and who is known to have had many prominent disciples, including Gangaraja. Another monk named in the inscription was Prabhad Chandra Siddhanta Deva, who is called Bhopadeva's guru for divine worship and who is also known to have taught a number of powerful lay disciples, including Vishnuvardhana's senior queen, Shantala Devi. 
We know from inscriptions that both these monks had a strong presence at Shravana Belgola, the most important site of Jain pilgrimage in southern India, located some 66 kilometers southwest of Dora Samudra. Neither of these monks was directly involved <clears throat> in the Parshvanatha Basadi's foundation, but the invocation of their names as part of the temple's lineage invested the temple with their authority. It was another monk in the same lineage, Nayakirti Siddhanta Chakravarti, who oversaw the temple's consecration. Although not in Shravana Belgola's records before this time, Nayakirti would later become an important figure at the Tirtha, a word for pilgrimage site, guiding many prominent temple building disciples during the second half of the 12th century. And here, I just briefly want to mention that S. Sekhar discusses these monks and others in his 1989 book on Shravana Belgola, Inviting Death. His analysis of the site's inscriptions and temples made a significant contribution to our understanding of Shravana Bogola's history. And more recently, the Deccan Heritage Foundation has published a guide to Shravana Bogola and other Jain temples authored by Julia Hegewald, which also helpfully summarizes the site's temples and history. But back to Dora Samudra. The name of the lineage to which the leaders of the Parshvanatha temple belonged was called the Mula Sangha, a prominent branch of Digambara Jains. Within the Mula Sangha, the temple's institutional leaders belonged to further subdivisions that I won't take the time to list in detail, but suffice to say that the very same divisions and subdivisions dominate the inscriptional records of Shravana Balgola between the 12th and 15th centuries. The same Mula Sangha lineage was also present at Dora Samudra's Nakara Jinalaya, today's Adinatha Basidi, and Shanti Natha Jinalaya, not too surprising since they all share a compound with the Parshvanatha temple. But this wasn't the only Jain, <coughs> Jain order of the Hoysala capital. The temples to the south of the Parshvanatha compound seem to have been affiliated with the Dramila Sangha, also called Dravida Sangha, another branch of Digambara Jains. Excuse me. <clears throat> Among these temples, one was called the Punisa Jinalaya. An inscription that was found in this area mentions that temple and the Dramila Sangha. Other temples in this cluster may have included the Vishnagardana Jinalaya, the Nagara Jinalaya, and the Hoysala Jinalaya. All three are named in inscriptions that also mention the Dramila Sangha. And the recent and I hope ongoing ASI excavations that I mentioned near the beginning of my talk promise to reveal more information about these temples. Among the Jain temples of Dora Samudra, then, the Parshvanatha Basidi had the longest standing institutional ties to Shravana Belgola. Beyond the affiliation it shared with Shravana Belgola's dominant monastic order, its patron's family played a leading role in the development of the pilgrimage site during the 12th century. Bopadeva's father, Gangaraja, was a prominent patron at Shravana Belgola, sponsoring the construction of an enclosure around the iconic Bahubali Colossus, which we'll see in a few moments, making generous land grants in support of the ritual life of the temples there, and setting up commemorative Nishidi memorial for his guru, Shubha Chandra Siddhanta Deva, whose name, remember, was also in the Parshvanatha temple's inscription. Um, and in Nishidi, by the way, is an inscriptional memorial commemorating a pious Jain who dies ritually by fasting at the end of life, renouncing everything. Several members of Bopadeva and Gangaraj's family also built temples, supported rituals, set up nishidis for their teachers and others, or were even themselves commemorated in nishidi memorials in or near the pilgrimage site. Given Gangaraja's renown as a patron at Shravana Belgola, a reputation that endured after his death, as attested by inscriptions from the next generation, the temple built in his honor by his son at Dora Samudra must have carried some association with those acts of patronage at the pilgrimage site, at least in the minds of the courtiers, merchants, pilgrims, and others who were familiar with both places. It wasn't just these social, institutional, and religious relationships that connected Dora Samudra's Parshvanatha temple to Shravana Belgola, however, or that otherwise contributed to its status. Having spent some time discussing this temple's networks of prestige, I'd like to return to its monumental jinnah. 
I'll explain how I think it too made a connection to the pilgrimage site, but first let's take a moment to consider what it's like to be in this temple, standing near this image of the Jinnah. With a height of some 4.5 meters, the sculpture dwarfs anyone in its presence. And I'm grateful to Anna Seastrand for modeling the scale in this photo taken during our visit together in November 2010. As one approaches the image, one becomes increasingly aware of its scale and of one's own comparatively small stature. The effect is humbling. And this sense of humility before the Jinnah was perhaps one motivation behind um, creating an image of its height. The monumental scale may also have been inspired by life stories of the Jinnahs, all of whom before the 24th Mahavira are said to have been of superhuman height. But I would argue that the sculpture was also meant to impress visitors in less religiously motivated ways. We've already seen that Bopadeva's foundation inscription unambiguously associates the temple and its image with power and glory. The monumental Jinna, Vijaya Parshvadeva, would have contributed to this glory, boosting the prestige of the temple's patron, his associates, and the city of Doris Mudra. Now, Jain devotional images of these proportions are found at a few locations throughout the subcontinent, including Kajaraho, Gwalior, and Rajorgar in the north, and Tirumalai in Tamil Nadu, but they're far from common. Their rarity makes their connection to place especially powerful, and the experience and memory of standing before Vijaya Parshvanatha would have been closely tied to the city of Dorasamudra. Of course, the most famous place to feature a colossal Jain image is Shravana Belgola. Carved in the late 10th century, Shravana Belgola's monolithic Bahubali, also called Gomateshvara, stands nearly 18 meters in height, far larger than any other Jain devotional image from this period. Approaching Shravana Belgola from a distance, Bahubali is unmissable at the summit of the larger of the two hills that define the landscape of the site. Two temples on Shravana Belgola's smaller hill, however, dedicated to the Jinnas Parshvanatha and Shantinatha, enshrine images closer in size to Dora Sumudra's monumental Jinnah. Shravana Belgola's Parshvanatha, which stands over five meters in height, including the serpent, is slightly larger than Dora Sumudra's. The image worshipped as Shantinatha is slightly shorter, just under four meters tall. Neither of these images or their temples are known to have a foundation inscription, but both stylistically predate surviving temples of the Hoysala capital. The Shantinatha is probably late 10th or early 11th century, and the Parshanatha is probably late 11th century or possibly very early 12th. Stylistic differences notwithstanding, the monumental Parshvanatha of Dora Samudra and Shravana Belgola share certain details that suggest the Jinnah in the capital city was in some respects based on its counterpart at the powerful pilgrimage site. At the most basic level, the sculptures are similar in scale and both represent one of the most iconographically distinctive Jinnahs. Whereas many of the 24 Jinnahs are similar in appearance, Parshvanatha is immediately identifiable by the seven-headed serpent that shelters him. More specifically though, both images are also elevated by lotus pedestals that rest on the floors of their respective sanctums. Such lotus pedestals are not a common feature. In most temples, Jina images rest on simpler pithas or on lion thrones. Another similarity lies in the detailed treatment of the back of each monumental image. It's more common for the back of a sculpture to remain relatively roughed out and unadorned, but the serpent bodies behind both Parshvanatha figures are articulated in cross-hatched scales on all sides. Both sculptures also feature curling vines inhabited by dynamic figures. Although the placement of the vine differs between the two, flanking the lower legs of the Shravana Bolgola image and the upper register of the Dora Samudra one, this feature provides another link between them. Although the Dora Samudra Parshvanatha is not a strict copy of its predecessor at Shravana Belgola, the shared details between the two suggest that the image at the capital may have deliberately referenced the image from the pilgrimage site. <clears throat> 
Whether or not the artists of the Dora Samudra image saw the Shravana Belgola Parshvanatha firsthand is uncertain, but Bopadeva surely would have been familiar with the earlier image. He or others with knowledge of the pilgrimage site could have verbally communicated the features of the Shravana Belgola sculpture to the artists in the capital. Numerous members of the Hoysala elite, including several members of Bopadeva's family, as well as other courtiers, merchants, members of Hoysala royalty, and Jing gurus, are named in inscriptions from both Shravana Belgola and Dora Samudra. These individuals and others whose names are not recorded certainly would have known both places, and many visitors to Vijaya Parshvanatha in the capital would have also been familiar with his counterpart at Shravana Belgola. Whether or not they were aware of every shared detail between the sculptures, I would speculate that for them, the Jina and Dora Samudra would have carried associations with the pilgrimage site, creating a link to its sacred authority. Having stood in the presence of one monumental Jina towering above them, the experience of standing before a second must have triggered a recollection of the former. Now, whoops, it's worth pausing to ask who actually would have been able to enter Dora Samudra's Parshvanatha temple to see its monumental devotional image. Certainly, those individuals named in the inscriptions I've just alluded to were among the most elite in Hoysala society. What about all the unnamed un individuals who visited the temple too, or who saw it as they went about life in the city? In a guidebook to Halibidu published in 1938, M. H. Krishna, then the director of the Archaeological Survey of Mysore, remarked that at that time, only Jains and high caste Hindus were allowed inside the Parshvanatha temple. So far, I haven't been able to determine whether access to the temple was restricted during the Hoysala period, um, wh whether access during the Hoysala period was restricted to people of particular religious affiliations or social classes, or whether anyone was free to enter. But even if the visual experience of the colossal Parshvanatha was only accessible to some of Dora Samudra's residents and visitors, for those who did see it, viewing the extraordinary image must have been a memorable experience associated strongly with its place and recalling similar visual experiences from Shravana Belgola. Notably, by the end of the Hoysala period, not only one but three monumental Jinnah images could be seen in Dora Samudra. In addition to Bopadeva's Parshvanatha, consecrated in 1133, the neighboring Shantinatha was dedicated in 1256, and another towering jinna from the ruins to the south probably dates to the 12th century. With each image, the association between such colossal jinnas and the Hoysala capital would have grown stronger. These sacred icons were also iconic of their place. Like Vijaya Parshvanatha, Parshvanatha, Dora Samudra's other two monumental jinnas probably also recalled the colossal images of Shravana Belgola. At least by the mid-13th century, however, when this Shantinatha was consecrated, Dora Samudra's own monumental jinna may have been the primary model. Located in the same compound as the Parshvanatha temple and run by the same monastic institution, the Mula Sangha, the monumental Shantinatha and its temple seem to have been directly inspired by the Parshvanatha. Though not as finely finished or intricately sculpted, both the temple and its image are quite similar in scale and layout to the earlier temple and the jinnah it enshrines. Now the Shantinatha Basri wasn't the only Jain temple to be built in Dora Samudra at this time. During the mid 13th century, the city saw a surge in Jain patronage. The King Narasimha III, who reigned from about 1255 to 1292, seems to have taken a special interest in Jain temples, and numerous inscriptions record his support for them. The earliest of these was issued when he was still a prince in 1254 CE and had visited the Parshvanatha temple. Engraved on the side of the temple's monumental foundation inscription stele, this fascinating text attests to the enduring relevance of inscriptions during the Hoysala period and the historical consciousness to which they contributed. By this time, the Parshvanatha temple was over 120 years old, but its patron was still remembered. The inscription of 1254 CE 
tells us that Narasimha had visited Bhopadeva Dannayaka's Vasudhi and presented an offering to Sri Vijaya Parshvadeva. Seeing the inscription in front of the temple, he ordered the reading of his lineage and royal descent. As the inscription was being read to him, he learned that a compound of buildings situated in land previously donated to the temple had become dilapidated. For the dharma of his lineage and for the prosperity of his father's kingdom, he had these buildings restored. A few months later, in 1255, early 1255, Narasimha granted additional land to the temple to support the worship of Sri Vijaya Parshvadeva. Intriguingly, he made this grant on the occasion of his Upanayana, or investiture. And this statement would seem to suggest that Narasimha himself was initiated into the Jain Mulasanga tradition of the temple. The term Upanayana, I don't think is likely to refer to his coronation as some authors have thought. Besides the words connotations with religious study, Narasimha is still called a prince in this inscription, Kumara, and the name of his father, the King Someshvara, appears at the end of the record. Even if the term does in this case refer to an investiture into kingship, however, Narasimha's donation to the Vijaya Parshvanatha at the time shows his commitment to the temple and the community it served. Early in his reign, he also supported the Shantinatha Basidi with a land grant at the time of that temple's consecration in 1256. Another sign of Narasimha III's commitment to Dora Sumudra's chain community is found in an inscription dating to 1265 CE. At that time, he made a generous land grant to support the operations of the newly constructed Trikuta Ratnatraya Shantinatha Jinalaya which is also referred to as the Trikuta Narasimha Jinalaya. Where this temple stood is not clear, but it is possible that it expanded the geographical extent of Dora Samudra's most prominent Jain institutions beyond the two clusters we've seen so far. The inscription stele that records its establishment was found to the north of Beniguda Hill, near the area marked Nelamalige on this map. Jain materials are also reported to have been found nearby in the area I've highlighted in yellow. In addition to the royal patronage of Narasimha III, Dora Samudra's Jain community received support from a broad base of merchants, monks, courtiers, and other individuals during the second half of the 13th century. In the inscription of the Shantinatha temple from 1256, we are told that one Vijayana, uh, and all the Jain Nakaras, or merchants, of Dora Samudra sponsored the construction of that Basidi. A few years later, in 1262, a number of merchants based in different towns across the Hoysala Kingdom made a donation to the Vijaya Parshvanatha Temple. And when the Trikuta Ratnatraya Jinalaya was founded a few years after that, it received not only a land grant from the king, but also a number of smaller gifts from individuals identified with various occupations. The patronage of Dora Samudra's Jain community was not limited to temple donations either. A number of Nishidi memorials were also sponsored during this period, commemorating monks and other pious Jains who died ritually by fasting at the end of life. Dating as late as 1300, these skillfully carved monuments were sponsored collectively by Jain citizens of Dora Samudra, and they describe the active careers of the monks they honor and the lineages of gurus to which they belonged. The collective patronage that we see in so many of Dora Samudra's Basidis and Nishidi memorials speaks to yet another kind of network at play in the Jain community of the Hoysala capital. The individual participants in this patronage may not have had the resources that Hoysala royalty or high-ranking courtiers like Bopadeva did, but by coming together, they too contributed to the city's Jain landscape and supported the activities of the temples and the revered monks who led them. As we've seen, many of these monks were linked to the prestigious Mula Sangha, the dominant monastic order at Shravanabal Gola during the Hoysala period. Their presence in Dora Samudra created a connection to the sacred Tirtha, a connection that seems to have been strengthened in new ways with the establishment of the Parshvanatha temple. Bopadeva's familial network, which included prominent patrons of Shravanabal Gola, also linked this temple to the pilgrimage site, 
The most notable among these patrons was Ganga Raja, in whose memory Bopadeva dedicated the Parshvanatha Janalaya. Recall that Bopadeva proudly built this temple in the middle of Dora Samudra, a place he considered to be the greatest of capital cities. The artistic beauty of the building, praised in its foundation inscription, was surely perceived to contribute further to the eminence of the city, as well as to honor the jinnas enshrined within the temple. And the monumental jinnah in its sanctum, which King Vishnivardhana himself named Vijaya Parshvadeva, simultaneously evoked the colossal images of Shravana Belgola and created a visual experience unique to its own place. Through his visual, sacred, and perhaps even political power, this monumental and charismatic jinnah attracted devotees and donors from multiple backgrounds and different cities, making Dora Samudra itself a jinn destination. Thanks. Thank you uh, for that wonderful lecture, uh, Catherine. Uh, it was really a wonderful tour of the sites that I don't think many people visit and it's um, it was really eye-opening. Um, I want to say to our audience, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box um, while you're uh, gathering your thoughts. Um, and typically once one question starts, they all start rolling in. Um, I'll ask one initial question to Dr. Kasdorf. Um, I was really interested in the, uh, the, the experience of these monumental sculptures, especially when they're inside um, of Asadi. And one question that occurred to me is, did, have you ever thought about the lighting of, of these temples and the lightscape that would have um, made the, uh, or, um, or illuminated the, um, the, the jinnah's body, because that definitely, I think, would uh, affect one's encounter with the jinnah. Most definitely. And, <clears throat> excuse me, actually, in the, um, in the Parshvanatha temple from Dora Samud, or from Halibidu, um, the, the door is positioned in such a way that um, the, the full body of the jinnah is illuminated in natural light, even when there are no other lights on in the temple. So assuming the, the door would have been open, um, even without any artificial lighting, you see that jinnah's body um, with the sunlight. I imagine that they would have also um, used oil lamps, however, um, and they might have, you know, I can imagine that lamps would have been hung in, in the sanctum, or um, perhaps there would have been a, a metal structure or something um, surrounding the jinnah or flanking the jinnah to, to hold um, additional oil lamps. Um, so yeah, certainly um, both, both natural and artificial light would have, would have impacted that um, really moving experience of being in his presence. I was just uh, thinking about how difficult it, it was for us to even get a good image of one of these, <laughs> one of the jinnas, um, and photography almost doesn't do the, the job <laughs> as, yeah. as, as much as we would want it to. Um, we have a first question from Gomti Vanketshwar. Um, I've been to Shravana Bengal. Belgola, and I thought the site and the monumental image of the Gotameshwara was more ancient than 11th century. Absolutely, yeah, it's a very ancient site, um, <clears throat> and actually, um, you know, even from the centuries BCE, um, there's evidence that it was a sacred site for Jains. Um, it was, it originally seems to have been um, primarily a site for ascetics to go and, and practice that uh, ritual fasting at the end of life. There are a lot of very old inscriptions commemorating individuals who performed that ritual. Um, it was around during the Ganga period, um, during the, the, around the 10th century, um, 9th, 10th century, that we start to see uh, more evidence of temple-based practices at Shafana Belgola. Uh, so um, there's a, the Chamundaraya Basidi on the smaller of the two hills, dates to the Ganga period. The um, colossal Gomateshra was, <clears throat> excuse me, 
was a, just a monolithic sculpture that was carved directly from the large hill um, on which it's situated in the late 10th century. Um, but as, as as Setar showed in his book on the site um, from the 1980s, you know, he, he did a great job, like really, really looking at all the inscriptions and analyzing them. And you really see this uptick in um, temple construction and um, temple practices in the 11th, 12th, 13th centuries. So the landscape of the site really changed during the Hoysala period, and a lot of temples came up there, but absolutely it's far more ancient than that. So we have a question that I, I mean, I think is actually a larger question um, by Renu Barik, who is asking about the rituals um, at Travana Belgola. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to sort of piggyback on that question is, do we have an understanding of sort of the larger uh, set of practices um, that would have been carried out there? Yeah, there's, um, you know, there's, uh, inscriptional references to um, providing all kinds of materials for, for these Jain temples, like oil lamps, like, um, you know, various materials for offerings, pretty similar to what we see in Hindu inscriptions, actually, or in inscriptions for Hindu temples and, and offerings. Um, so, and in terms of the Abhisheka, um, that's that ritual pouring of consecrated substances over the colossal Gomateshwara that happens every every eleven years. I think I'm blanking all of a sudden um, mm -hmm. at Shavana Belgola. You know, really interestingly, um, in the Shanti Natha Temple at Halebidu, there are big staircases at, on flanking either side of the sanctum um, that allow people to go up and access the top of the jinna and those probably post-date the Hoysala period, I would say, um, but, you know, it, it seems quite possible that um, Abhisheka may have, have been part of the rituals, if not during the Hoysala period, certainly later. Um, one, but, one thing that I would mention that your, this lecture and other lectures that you've given before do so well is um, I think uh, in you gave a paper at Subhashni Kalagotla's Temple Cultures Conference recently, and and what you're what you in even just navigating through the roads or or or, or, or putting temples in, in 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 dialogue with each other, something that I think that your work does so well is actually get to that culture all around the temple. That it's not just the temple; it's all these other bits that are that um that are around it i'm aware of our time and we try to keep these sessions to about an hour but um and we might have a little bit of time after the recording but our final question will go to tilo de Tigue, who asks is there evidence for the patronage of the dravida sangha temples at halibidu was it different castes or social groups than the temples related to the mula sangha or was there royal support for these two so that's a really good question. There's certainly evidence of patronage of the Dravida Sangha there because we have um, several inscriptional references to the Dravida Sangha with temples, with names that suggest some kind of a connection to royalty like Hoysala Jinalaya, like Vishnu Vardhana Jinalaya. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, those temples patrons could have simply named them after Hoysala kings and the Hoysala royal family. Uh, but it's also possible that Hoysala royalty supported those temples. But we really don't know all the temples, I mean, excuse me, all of the inscriptions that name the Dravida Sangha um, are, are really fragmentary. So we only see these brief references to it. We don't really um, have a whole lot of information about the patrons, um, but certainly elite individuals also patronize the Dravida Sangha there. Thank you, Catherine, today for your lecture today. And I'm really looking forward to seeing a lot of this in print and, and looking forward to how it changes, how we understand everything um, in the Deccan too. Um, so please join me in thanking um, Dr. Catherine Kasdor for her lecture today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and um, our next lecture will be by Mohit Manohar, who is a graduate student at Yale.
um, and his lecture is entitled A Victory Tower Built by a Slave, the Chand Minar at Dolatabad um, on November 12th um, at 2 p.m. London time. So we look forward to hosting you then. Thank you.